Last June, I crossed a significant threshold. I turned 40, which means, I, I don't know why people are already laughing at that, but anyways, there you go. <laughs> I went from being young and inexperienced to being over the hill and irrelevant, and one fell swoop. And in fact, some of you, you might be thinking to yourself, wow, I thought you were a lot older than 40. You certainly look older than 40. That's what our seminarian Aaron thought. He got here, he thought Father Alex was 40, so he thought I must be 50 or so. <laughs> Anyways, leading up to my 40th, I was inspired by a friend who marked his 40th by setting some ambitious goals. And th so I thought to myself, you know what, I'm going to do a triathlon. I'd never done one before, so I had to look it up. These are the Olympic distances, a 1.5 kilometer swim, a 40 kilometer bike, and a 10 kilometer run. So I began training around this time last year, and the run particularly was painful for me, unlike Father Alex, who is built like a long distance runner, I have the physique of a tortoise. <laughs> and so I tried my best and I went for it and I continued training and increased dis distances and these, these various components. Now, I wasn't able to get into, into the pool because of COVID and so I figured, you know what, I'm just going to do my own personal version of a duathlon. I'll do a 40 kilometer bike and a 10 kilometer run. So the training continued, I made sacrifices and finally my birthday arrived. Now I booked off the afternoon and went for it. I began the bike and, and things were going good at the beginning. But 40 kilometers is a long time, it's almost two hours in the saddle, and over time I started to get bored and asked the question, why? <laughs> why am I even doing this? But I just, you know, I was determined to keep going, and I went, by accident, I went a bit farther, I did 44 kilometers, and I got home, I put on my running shoes, and I started pounding the pavement. And I made it not two kilometers, and my legs were starting to seize up. My calves were cramping, and I just thought to myself, am I going to have to call Father Alex to come pick me up? And there he would arrive in his Ford Fiesta <laughs> to drive me home, which would have been humiliating on all kinds of levels. But I kept going. I stopped, I stretched, and I kept going. I made it to the five-kilometer mark, and again, my calves were cramping up. And I was asking myself, why? Why am I even doing this? And I had to dig deep and remind myself, nobody knows that I'm doing this. It's not for bragging rights. It's not to achieve some, some number that's made up. It's not even really about getting into shape physically. And it's not because I'm having a midlife crisis, despite what Father Alex thinks. Uh, but my original motive was I wanted to mark this milestone this significant moment, my 40th, to create a memory. As if to say, yeah, I am getting older, but I still got it, right? And so I kept going, and I finished, I got home, finished that last 5K, and so I'd completed the whole thing, you know, 44 kilometers on the bike, 10 kilometers running. I took a shower, I had some supper, and I actually went sailing that night. And the crew, they, they talked about throwing me overboard so that I could just swim in the rest of it, you know. But as I reflect back on that experience, it was harder than I imagined. And there were moments when I was tempted to quit, and so often this question arose, why? Why? Often I think in life we start things strong, and then we lose steam as time goes on. And this applies to all kinds of things, but especially challenges that take a particular amount of time or a significant amount of sacrifice. And I can think of a few. Maybe it's a physical challenge, like signing up for a race or deciding I'm going to lose uh, a certain number of pounds. And you start strong, you, you get to the gym, you start to eat healthy, and maybe you even see some immediate results. And then over time, your motivation fades. Or perhaps it's a mental challenge. Maybe at work, you, you're assigned to some project and it's really complex. And it's going to require months and months of effort to get it done. There's so many variables. And yet you're excited for the challenge. But then as time passes, there's setbacks. 
there's obstacles, teammates don't come through with their end of the work, and you just start thinking, I hope they reassign me to a new project. <laughs> or for me, this comes to reading books even. I don't know how many times I've started reading a book, and then I, I quit partway through. I make it about, I have this long list of books that I've read about the first 20 or 30 percent. And then I set them aside because I've gotten bored, and it's like, I wonder what this other book, this new book, this will be exciting. Maybe I'll start that one. Or maybe this applies to a, an emotional or a relational kind of challenge. Anybody who's been married for any length of time, you know, the honeymoon phase, it doesn't last. Those warm fuzzies, they start to fade over time. And marriage turns out to be much harder than it looks in the movies right? Or, or any kind of relationship, a friendship. Maybe you, you find a friend or a roommate, a companion, somebody who is like, this is an answer to prayer. And then over time, you start to see their, their weaknesses. They start to get on your nerves. Father Alex, <clears throat> uh, and you start thinking, you know, maybe I need a new friend. Or the same could apply to spiritual challenges like Lent, this season we find ourselves in. I was thinking, if only the church could streamline this season down to a week, you know, seven days of Lent, I would crush it. But here we are, we've got these 40 days, we've already been at it for a month, and it just kind of, you start strong and then lose steam. At least I do. I lose my motivation. I start asking, why? Why am I giving up this thing? I get fixated on this, this sacrifice I'm supposed to be making, and I, I lose steam. I lose motivation. Here we are at the fifth Sunday of Lent, and, which means there's only two weeks left, and we're only one week to Holy Week, which basically doesn't count, so might as well phone it in, right? <laughs> Better luck next year, Lent of 2023. Well, guess what's going to happen next year? The same thing. We might start strong, motivation is high, and then the novelty wears off, and it starts to fade. So what do we do in the face of this human tendency? Well, we have, as always, an answer response in sacred scripture. And today I want to look at the second reading from Philippians. Paul is writing to this community, this early church community, who even early then, they were starting to lose steam. And he's challenging them to keep going. Don't forget your why. He writes this, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. So there's this image he offers of a race, that we are all runners in a race. And it's not a sprint, it's more like a marathon. And he's urging them, strain forward, press on. He uses this phrase a couple times in a few short verses. He's saying, press on towards the finish line, which by the way, the finish line is heaven. The finish line, like, we're not in this race to win a medal. We're in this race to win eternity. And Jesus is at the finish line. Paul's saying, you got to keep your eyes on the prize. That's where we should focus. This, this prom you want to talk about promises, this ultimate promise of heaven. This ultimate promise, and spoiler alert, but at the end of Lent, guess what we're going to celebrate? Easter, we're going to celebrate this promise of the resurrection, this promise of new life, this promise that God offers us, yes, at the end of our life, to spend eternity with him, but even now that in this life we can experience the grace of new life, meaning and purpose in this life. And Paul is offering in this passage a number of ways for how we can press on. And I just want to hone in on one, this way in which uh, we're called to rediscover, I think, our original motivation, our why. Just to give a bit of context, a few verses before this, Paul's giving a whole list of things, his, his resume, if you will. He says, 
I was born of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew, born of Hebrews. I followed all the Jewish laws perfectly. I was a Pharisee, meaning I was an expert in the law. And then, on the road to Damascus, I encountered Jesus, this person who is God. And he goes on to say this, Now I regard everything as loss. Because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Next to everything else I had, it's lost next to knowing Jesus. He's saying, now I keep my eyes on the prize. This prize of coming to know Jesus. And he continues, for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Now, this word rubbish, it's translated in English as rubbish in the original Greek. It's the word skubalon, which is kind of fun to say, skubalon. Uh, skubalon is actually refers to another S word that has four letters in it. And I'm not going to use that word in church today, but you can guess what it is. But just to help you understand, you know, if I were to use it uh, now in a contemporary sentence, I would say, you know, given my experience, I might rename this seasonal minty beverage the Mixkubalon. You know? <laughs> Paul, he's saying, everything is scubalon. Everything is rubbish. All these things that I had, all of, all of my resume, all the things that I thought were so important, it's nothing. It's loss next to knowing Jesus. In other words, you, he realized this whole time, I've been in the wrong race. And I wonder if any of us can relate. We've been in the wrong race. We've fixed our eyes on the wrong priorities. And Paul's saying, I've, I've been trying to be the best Jew I can possibly be, but now I've discovered Jesus. He is the prize. He is the one I need to run towards. And I'll say it this way. The, the main lesson is this. If you want to win the prize, you have to reprioritize. Just say that with me. If you want to win the prize, you have to reprioritize. We've got to look at our lives honestly and say, where have, have I been fixing my eyes? And maybe it's time to reprioritize for the real win. And my challenge to all of us is, is simple. With these two weeks that remain of Lent, let's not worry about how our Lent has been so far or if we've lost motivation or, or whatever. Let's make these last two weeks of Lent the best two weeks of Lent. Let's, let's really go forward. Let's forget what lies behind. Let's strain forward to what lies ahead and keep our eyes on the prize. Let's reprioritize. As I say, the finish line is heaven. And Jesus is there waiting for us. Let's not get fixated on our sacrifices. Though they're important and our Lenten penances, they matter. But instead of keeping our eyes directed on those things that are challenging, we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. I want to end by sharing a story about a teenage girl who lost her why her sense of motivation. She's 19 years old now. She's beautiful inside and out. She's intelligent, articulate. She's an athlete. You may or may not know Gabby Scholard, but you might recognize her father, Bill. And uh, Gabby, when she was 12 years old, of her own volition, she asked to be baptized. And so she made this huge step. She's, she's got a, a profound faith even. So she's baptized here at St. Benedict's Parish at the age of 12. From the outside looking in, it looks like she's, she's got the perfect life, and yet inside she was struggling. Not only was she tempted to quit the race, she was tempted to give up on life. When she was 17, she started to battle serious depression and, and even suicidal thoughts. 
And I know that there's many people who struggle, even secretly, with the battle of depression. With this existential question, why? Why bother? Why take one more step? And as um, we know from statistics, just uh, if there was a mental health crisis before, since the pandemic, that crisis has doubled. And so this is a real issue. And so what did Gabby do? Well, if you want to win the prize, you've got to reprioritize. Instead of just fixating on the issue, on the obstacle, on the struggle, she started to journal. She started to write one thing every day to help her refocus one thing, one reason to press on. And at the end of the year, she had 365 reasons to stay alive. And uh, she, she compiled them into this book, which she just published, called Why I Stay. And all of the reasons there, there, there's a series of some that are silly, some that are cute, some that are really profound. But she wanted to share her experience with others to inspire them, knowing that, that there are so many others who struggle with this. And we're so proud of Gabby for her courage and uh, the way that she's already ministering to people who struggle in this way. I wanted to share uh, a quote from her penultimate reason, number 364. She says this, You can find all the temporary vices to distract yourself from your hurts, but the answer to eternal joy is a relationship with your Creator. If you can't live for you, give your life to him, and it'll be given a whole new meaning. So whether you're struggling to stay in the race that we call Lent, or you're struggling to stay in the race that we call life, I just want to urge you to keep your eyes on the prize. If you want to win the prize, you've got to reprioritize Jesus is the prize. He's at the finish line waiting for us. And maybe it's time to take our eyes off of ourselves or off of our sacrifices or off of our struggles and to fix our eyes on him because he will provide everything that we need to press on.